I like talks that make us feel like we're part of the conversation. I had a professor in college who, whenever he wanted to close discussions, he would just say semicolon. And this was his signal that we needed to stop. But it was very likely that the conversation would take a different form at a later time. And the conversation I'm here to share with you today actually started for me almost 30 years ago, when I was 14 years old, growing up on the west coast of the United States. And it was the mid-1980s, and we were learning about World War II. And a man came into our class one day and talked with us about how his mother had survived concentration camps. And this story stayed with me for a very long time and sparked a deep interest, not only in the Holocaust, but also in human rights and in human behavior. And if it wasn't for him sharing his part of the conversation back then, I definitely wouldn't be standing here today sharing mine with you. After the talk, I went home and asked my parents what they knew about the Holocaust. And they immediately said, ask your grandfather. He was in the war. And the next time I saw my grandpa, who, by the way, was this kind of easygoing, gentle kind of a personality, when he heard my question, what I remember him saying was, it was a terrible time. Don't ask me again. It was like he had shut down. And I, being the obedient granddaughter, never did ask again. But his response piqued my interest. And I started reading everything that I could about the topic. And not only that, I actually learned how to write letters to the authors uh, through their publishers. So I got into this rhythm of reading a book, and if I had more questions, I'd put together a letter and send it off. And when I was 16, I got an answer in the mail one day that kind of blew me away. Not only because it was covered with foreign stamps and airmail stickers, but because it actually came from Meep Gies, the woman who had worked so hard to try to save Anne Frank and her family in Amsterdam. She had written a book called Anne Frank Remembered and was kind enough to respond to my letter. And there were two things about her response that struck me. One was that she said, I receive so many, many letters, and I answer everyone. I think at some level this made me feel less alone, knowing that there were other Jennifers out there in the world that also cared about the history. And she also said, we only did our human duty, help people who need help. And this is something that, in fact, a lot of people who worked with the resistance during the war, afterwards, they'd actually share this same sentiment. I wasn't a hero. I didn't do anything special. I just did what you're supposed to do, which is to help people. A quick note about my family at this time. We had actually moved to the Bay Area in California. My father was really talented with computers, and he wanted to pursue a career in Silicon Valley. And it was very clear to me that a position in corporate America would also be, in fact, my best professional opportunity. And for a while, I did try to follow in his footsteps. I even spent a year working at the same Fortune 100 company where he was also employed. But in 1995, after this year, the company was ready to promote me, in fact, to the next level, but I made the decision to quit. And I quit because of two reasons, really. One, I couldn't really see me spending my life in a cubicle in Silicon Valley. That just wasn't me, I suppose. Um, but also because there was kind of this energy inside, like a voice kind of nudging me, that after 10 years of reading and self-study, what I really wanted to do was to come to Europe to see where the Holocaust happened. So I quit the company, said yes to my voice, and set up a summer trip. And part of that summer trip was actually a two-week service project in the former concentration camp in Dachau. When I think about my younger self at that time, I was in my mid-20s, I realize now how open my heart and my mind was actually at the beginning of that journey. And in Buddhism, there's this idea of beginner's mind, that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In August of 1995, I arrived at this international youth meeting under the banner of remembering, meeting, understanding, and working for the future. Now, the idea of this project was to spend time with survivors and historical eyewitnesses, to learn about the Nazi time, obviously, and also to perform community service work in the former camp. 
There was a group of activists behind this project that actually were in the process of trying to build a Jugendbegegnungsstätte, a youth meeting center. And behind these activists were a group of survivors and eyewitnesses. Max Meinheimer was actually a Jew from the Czech Republic, the only survivor in his family. He survived Auschwitz in Theresienstadt and was actually liberated in Dachau. Miriam and Els were part of the Dutch resistance, similar to Miep Gies. And Marie-Louise Schulze-Jan was someone who, during the war, was a student at the university in Munich. And in fact, when the core group of White Rose students were killed in 1942, Marie-Louise and some friends actually started to reprint and redistribute those original pamphlets. She, too, would actually be caught by the Gestapo, but was not given a death sentence. She was actually put into prison and obviously managed to survive until the end of the war. You might be asking yourselves, at least some of you, if this isn't kind of depressing. I've gotten that question a lot. And the thing is, is when you're surrounded by people like this, it really isn't depressing because they're sort of the light in the darkness. Um, the maintenance work, actually, that we did in the memorial site was the community service part, and not only an act of service, but also a time for reflection for us. So the other surprise that summer was to actually learn that Dachau is also a town. In fact, it's 1,200 years old, and the current population of the town today is actually about 46,000 people. It offers a nice middle-class lifestyle. There's good schools, jobs. It's 20 minutes away from Munich. The Altstadt, the old part of town, was actually never bombed. So the buildings are well-preserved, cobblestone streets, nice shops. There's a Catholic church at the top of the hill. The Wittelsbach royal family actually had their summer residence in Dachau. So today, this is a nice place you can imagine for the Sunday walk and coffee and cake. You can also buy postcards. The Amper River flows through the town as well. So I mentioned the population, about 46,000 people. But the thing is, is that there's hundreds of thousands, approaching, in fact, one million visitors who come to Dachau each year. Most of them don't see any of the images that I've just shown you. They come directly to the memorial site to see the former camp. A large number of this group are actually German high school students, and then, of course, the international community, people coming from every corner of the world to learn what happened. When visitors come to the memorial site today, they're actually met with this quote, Dachau, the significance of this name will never be erased from German history. It stands for all concentration camps which the Nazis established in their territory. It's important to realize that Dachau is unique because the town and the camp actually share the same name. And this is not the case for other locations. So, for example, Buchenwald is in Weimar, Sachsenhausen is in Ronnenberg near Berlin. But this issue that the town and the camp share the same name has actually been a struggle for the local people in the post-war time. Um, this aerial photo, taken in 2006, actually gives us a better sense of the space that we're talking about here. The yellow actually marks the entire compound, which mainly is comprised of the former SS training school, which today is used by the Bavarian police. And in blue, the blue rectangle marks the former prisoners' camp, what is today the memorial site. Dachau is also unique because it was the camp that was actually in operation the longest. Within six weeks of Hitler coming to power, Dachau was taking its first prisoners. Prisoners were brought into a building, and they were forced to give up all of the belongings that they had with them. So this meant their wallets, their documents, their bags, their jewelry, their clothing. They were showered and given prisoners' uniforms. This space is now the renovated museum, which is actually the main focal point of learning at the site. In 1965, after the camp had been used as a displaced persons camp, in fact, for 20 years, it opened as an international memorial to the general public. And as you can imagine, there are all kinds of structures and memorials to actually look at. Never again, back in the mid-60s, this reminder actually meant never again fascism. There are religious spaces there as well, the Protestant Church of Reconciliation, the Carmelite convent, and the Jewish memorial. There's a creek as well that served as a natural barrier between the prisoners' camp and the SS training school, 
and different postcards. I actually would eventually train to be a teacher, and I now realize that this learning model that we experienced during that project, testimony, service, history, and reflection, all brought together at the authentic site, is very, very powerful and effective. Most of us actually learn about the experience of the six million Jews, but a place like Dachau actually teaches you as well about the five million non-Jewish victims of National Socialism. So the Sinti and Roma, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the physically and the mentally disabled, the political prisoners, homosexuals, antisocials, Slavs, and the Catholic priests. The other opportunity that I had there during those weeks was actually to learn about the perpetrators as well because of the proximity of the SS training school. And this is all to say that something else that happens in a space like this is that, you know, when you learn about the Holocaust, perhaps outside of Germany, even outside of Europe, it can get a little bit compartmentalized in the sense that you learn about victims, you learn about perpetrators, you might learn about bystanders, but it's kind of presented in this sort of very black and white, maybe almost tidy kind of a way. And after a couple of weeks in Dachau, one of the main lessons that I had received was that, in fact, it wasn't that way at all in many cases. And there really is this gray area that we sort of grapple with. The other powerful aspect of the site is that the topography actually helps inform the whole history. Dachau is only 20 minutes away from Munich, as I mentioned before. Munich was the Stadt der Bewegung, the city of the movement. This was the site of Nazi party headquarters. This was also the city that Hitler said was closest to his heart. And you really get a sense of the connection between Dachau and Munich, the role that Munich played in Bavaria, and then, of course, the role that the region played in the greater expansion of National Socialism. Also, that Dachau was a main camp that oversaw a subsidiary network of 169 other camps. So the significance of this place, as Kogan had said, is critical. The other aspect of this is that Dachau, of course, in this model can be replaced. So these same types of lessons, the breadth and the depth that can be achieved here, can also be achieved in places like Buchenwald, Ravensbruch, Sachsenhausen. At the end of the project, I was actually invited to come back and train as an educator to work with the English-speaking visitors. And I would actually end up spending three years of my life working and living there. And, you know, Rilke's advice about living with the questions was very, very helpful to me during this time, because the nature of my process was I'd get an answer to one question and sort of feel like I took one step forward, but then I'd get more information and sort of take two steps back. So his advice was helpful. And also working with the visitors, they had questions all the time. And these were some of the ones that came up again and again. Why is the memorial so clean? How do people live here? Why don't I feel more? Is the McDonald's okay? Where was God? Why does genocide still happen? And of course the question, what can we do? And the context of what we can do often came in the face of what can we do when confronted with a former concentration camp, but also what can we do when confronted with war or current human rights abuses? What can we do in our own lives and communities when we're confronted with things that we don't think are fair? So the good news is, is that summer camp doesn't exist anymore. The center actually was built. And Max and Miriam are still coming. They're in their early 90s now, in fact. And they named the Learning Center, actually, after Max. This year will mark the 32nd year of this project, which now takes place in the Learning Center. Um, and just to highlight that these grassroots efforts that really started in Germany in the early 80s have been relatively successful. Dachau is not the only memorial site that had these projects and also wanted to build these centers. So in fact, there is now a very nice network of these learning centers where people can meaningfully engage in remembering and learning in these safe places. 
I tracked down the man who spoke to my class so long ago. I wanted to say thank you and let him know how his story had affected me. And this is a picture of he and his wife from last summer. His name's Peter. And his mother there, um, Rosa, who I also had the opportunity to meet actually before she passed away. And she, like Max, was actually a Czech Jew who also had survived Auschwitz. And when I met Peter, one of the things that he said to me was, um, at the time that he was speaking to my class, she had no idea that he was sharing her story publicly. There's a great book about the Dalai Lama called The Open Road, written by Pico Iyer, and he quoted Aldous Huxley as saying, it's a bit embarrassing to have been concerned with the human problem all one's life, and to find at the end that one has no more to offer by way of advice than to try to be a little kinder. And when I read this, this was that beautiful aha moment, I think that Rilke was talking about, that you really will get an answer sometime to these questions. So for me, the idea of being a little kinder is actually the answer to that question, what can we do? Which leads me to my current project called Visit Memorials. This is my offering, because I find myself back at this beginner's mind space where there's nudges again towards, one, sharing my knowledge and experience, probably with educators who are working in Europe who would like to more effectively integrate the memorial sites into their Holocaust curriculum, but perhaps others find it useful as well. But not only that, but to kind of facilitate a new conversation around kindness. And the two questions that I'm living with most at the moment are, what does kindness actually look like? and how can we cultivate it? And it seems like my timing is pretty good because these ideas of empathy and compassion and mindfulness seem to be coming up again and again. There's certainly a wider conversation around these concepts and even research. I was uplifted actually a couple of weeks ago. I came across a report that was linking kindness and mindfulness and compassion and empathy with the idea that if we practice these skills and if we learn these skills, that in fact we have an opportunity to create more ease in our relationships, which would of course in turn would affect our communities and hopefully bring more peace actually to the world at large. So this is where you come in. On the website in the upper right hand corner, there's a little button that says be kinder. And this will take you to a form that will let you, in a very easy way, share how you've been kinder today. And that might be you've been kinder to somebody else. I kind of think that's the easy challenge. Um, but maybe what might be a little bit more difficult is how have you even been kinder to yourself, perhaps? Because self-empathy is also a key in this conversation. So I'd love you to be a part of that, if you would. And we're going to put a semicolon there. Thank you.